We're here again to um, to talk about the uh, effects of COVID on the music industry. Um, and I'm Noel Cornford, and I run a um, an agency called Inside Out Talent. I represent um, a lot of bands, as well as curating stages for uh, truck and tram lines and why not. Um, uh, so I deal in kind of lots of different areas, and so I thought it would be interesting to to talk to loads of different people in in different areas of the industry and find out how the whole this whole shenanigan is is affecting everyone directly and, and he hear it from the the horse's mouth. So so today we have Paul Hutton from Crosstown Concerts. Um, Paul, uh, hello. Hello, Noel. How are we? <laughs> We're very well. Thank you for doing this. Um, tell us a little bit about your your past and and your present and what and yeah how this is all affecting you at the moment. Okay. Well, I, I, someone once said to me, "You're a career promoter," so I suppose I must be now. Um, I've probably been doing this for getting on for thirty years. I worked at a company called Metropolis for many years, um, and then when that tailed off for me, uh, we started our own company called Crosstown. That's myself and Connell Dodds, who had also been at Metropolis with me um this has been going about three and a half years so you know all this has probably not come at the best time for us in any way i mean not that it was a good time for anybody but you know i guess in promoter terms we're still starting out with this company um i guess if people say to you, you know who do you promote i mean i look at the posters on the wall um the whole steady gomez the vaccines noel gallagher snow patrol the Pixies, um, but we do a lot of new small bands as well. I mean, the thing about promoting, uh, if people don't know, is it's, you know, it's finding acts when they're on their way up and hopefully, you know, helping them, you know, get go through the gears and hanging on to their coattails at the very end when they start making serious money. That was one of the, one of the reasons I wanted to chat to you specifically was because you do deal with different ends of the, of the market and have done in the, in the, over the years, you've dealt with the biggest names and, and you're dealing with new acts as well. So, how that it affects those different ends will, will be quite interesting too, I think. Um, so you say, yeah, how has this, how has this hit you? One, you know, factor that dominates it obviously is, you know, as live promoters, um, it's just no live shows uh, in this, you know, we haven't got any back catalogue, you know, we're not like a record label or anything like that. You know, once the show's finished, it's, it, it might have made money, it may have lost money, but it's done and, and move on to the next day. So we've gone from, it's cliff edge really, I suppose, in that sense, you know, we've gone from earning a, a living kind of, we probably do one or two shows every single day of the year, you know, on average. Sometimes they're 100 capacity, sometimes they're 10,000 capacity, um, but there's always something going on. And we went from, uh, I think our last show was on March the 16th. So we've not had to go out at all in the evening since then. Um, and so how many, uh, how many of you are there in, in the office? And uh, for 15 people so you know that's a lot of people who are well currently furloughed making use of the government scheme there um you know we've actually you know we haven't got we're not we haven't really got anything to do uh, apart from repeatedly move all the shows that we had in so if we had some show you know we had a lot of shows between march and may because busy time one of the busiest times of the year march to may you know um so they all moved but when they first moved, they only moved a few weeks because everybody thought this was like some temporary flu-like blip. So quite a lot of shows moved from March to May and then from May until, let's say, November. Yeah. And now they've moved to March of next year. Somebody, some, we've even got shows moving into November of next year. Now, if it's quite a big established act, that kind of makes sense because they, they're kind of planning a year, 18 months ahead. Yeah. But we've got people who are playing relatively small venues, very small venues, moving their shows a year. Now, a year is a very long time, you know, in, in the development of an act that's probably only worth 200 people at the moment. You know, it's very hard to plan more than, you know, two, three months ahead, I'd have thought, in a band like that. But people are moving stuff a year back now. It's almost like everybody thinks everything's going to be frozen in time. Do you know what I mean? It's sort of, yeah. it's like this has become one extended summer holiday that's going to end and the bad dream will be over. So have you still got shows um, booked in for that sort of September to November kind of period? Very few. Um, there's a few s smaller shows, generally. Anything that, that's kind of, let's say, a, a broad brush stroke, anything that's above a thousand has definitely moved. Anything that's not British, 
has definitely moved. Yeah. Um, I think there's a few people hanging in there that, you know, they could probably move it uh, two or three weeks notice if they had to, you know, smaller venues. And there's a few artists who are going to stick it out. You know, this is, you know, then let's say they were getting the tour in March and they've moved it to November. They've got the, the album will be a year old, let's say by November. Yeah. If they don't play then, I think they're just going to cut their losses, not play on that album, record something next year and have another go, you know, well, which is yeah, pretty depressing. I mean, a lot of artists just cannot promote their material in any way. At the moment. Yeah. What happens with those new artists that, that when, when festivals, and you deal with festivals as well, don't you? Um, you, you run your own festivals too, is that right? Yeah. A couple yeah. Of we've got a couple of events in Bristol. We've got a thing we do on the Downs, a thing we do, an event we do on the Downs. Uh, which is a 30,000 capacity um, site. And we've also got a thing we do in the harbour side in Bristol, which is a 5,000 capacity, five nights. So have you, um, have you just copied those lineups over to next year? We wanted to move everybody over lock, stock and barrel, yeah. Because um, they're all kind of artists of a size that, that you know, nothing's going to change in their lives, you know. It's like, you know, you know, it wasn't Paul Weller wasn't doing it, but say someone like Paul Weller and Noel Gallagher in a year's time, they're still going to be Paul Weller and Noel Gallagher. You know, a lot of other acts, um, newer acts, you know, in a year's time might not, might not be around. So, yeah, we want to just move those over. But I think if you're alluding to the festivals generally, um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about them picking up the festival and just moving it, which is makes a lot of sense. And then people hold on to their tickets and, and so forth but obviously that then means that all the people who were scheduling on playing festivals next year won't be playing it but then obviously we're getting onto another area of, of, of how the festival market has completely skewed the live music industry and obviously it's it's a broken business model as is proven by the fact of this year so do you think there will be so for new artists who um who are just emerging now or, or new albums that are coming out in the next few months that will want to promote those albums next year um yeah or, or launch their careers on the on the festival scene um those doors a lot of those doors are going to be closed for them right i don't think that, that that's critical to bands i think the, the biggest problem i would imagine you know having spoken to some bands is just dealing with the disappointment of it all i think in a way you know i mean i suppose if you think of it in these terms if you were like a band who was going to play the Scala in London. This was your big show, right? You know, it's 800 people. This is your big, you know, you're going to do the Scala in March. You know, you've, you've finally got your, you're on the ladder, you're on the rung, you know, you're ready to step it up. You know, you're going to do the, the Scala in March and you've got the electric ballroom penciled in for November. And if it all goes great, you know, that's how it all goes sort of thing. And that could be on any level. That could be a smaller venue. It could be a bigger venue, but you know, so that Scala show they were going to do then moved to November. So already they're, they're six months back in their kind of, process you know now that's moved to march of next year so they've had to put back a year you know and i think for a lot of young bands new bands that might be too long you know for a number of reasons whether they can afford to keep doing it because obviously no bands making money at that stage whether they want to keep doing it you know they might be bored with it by then um and also you know maybe that was their moment maybe march of this year was their moment you know maybe in a year's time their music is not going to be what people want you know and they and they didn't they weren't able to capitalize on it at the time you know so you think as so as well as potentially losing a few festivals and losing a few venues through this process we might lose a few bands as well yep i think we're definitely going to lose a few bands i mean you know anybody listening to this probably knows but if they don't it isn't really until you get up to say 2,000 capacity venues, you know, in London and maybe a thousand out of town or something like that, that anybody's really making any money, you know? So, you know, when you read about, you know, bands, you know, little bands that are coming along that are doing really well, they're not making any money. They're, it's, they're probably paying to be in a band still, you know, they've probably got greater outgoings than income. Most bands have got a part-time job, you know, and I, I mean, I imagine most bands have probably got a part-time job in the hospitality sector. So not only have they not got their bands, it's, it's a double whammy for them, you know? So it's tough, you know? And it's funny, actually, because everybody's talking about, you know, when the, when the music's going to start again and everything, which is great. Um, but I don't know if a lot of people have asked the bands. Not, you know, I mean, maybe bands won't want to play. Maybe they'll be the ones that are going to be the, the thing that might delay us as well. You know, who wants, you know, 500 thousand two thousand ten thousand five hundred whatever it is people facing you you know shouting your words back to you you know it might not be the healthiest thing you um and you you have a management sector as well don't you to your 
uh, company. Yeah, we do. We do. So, um, so again, there's there's another element there. What what's the so from the, again from the horse's mouth of the artist? What what have they kind of been saying to you? Are they obviously they're concerned um, on and just their day to day? You know how how are they kind of getting by? Are they have to go out and find other jobs or any of your acts? It's a bit. They haven't really got much to aim at, have they? You know, I mean, I've spoken to a couple of people rec recently who put their albums out um, in spite of the situation because they felt that putting it back, you know, till, you know, September, October, November of this year, you know, it was probably something they might have had recorded for over a year by that point. And maybe, and they felt it wouldn't be that, you know, wouldn't be fresh and it, they'd be a bit stale by then and stuff. And they've just accepted they're not going to be able to promote it, you know, by the, let's say traditional route of playing live. So, yeah. you know, get it out and see what you can do. And in theory, you've got uh, a lot more listening time on, on people's hands at the moment. So yeah, I think so. You, you might, know, you've got a chance. Pick up people through, uh, yeah, different reasons because they're actually sat at home looking for, it's, it's more time to try new stuff out and try new things. It's whether, it's whether it reaches them or not, isn't it? That's the, that's the problem. Yeah, you know, I mean, look, I think, if you asked any PR people, you know, that they'd probably say, oh, you know, especially if it's, let's say it's a, not all bands play live anyway, we know that, but if they're a, if they're a band that, that it's part of their, you know, part of their DNA to go and play live, you know, I guess it, it, it's a huge disappointment. And also, you know, bands always think need something to aim at, don't they? You know, you can rehearse twice a week for as, many, for as long as you want, but unless you've actually got something to do it for after a while, it must become very boring and dull. What, what do you think that, a genuine kind of time scale could be i'm not asking you to give me the answer obviously but um what are your thoughts i think the, I think the, <laughs> I think the time scale now will be when <laughs> the economy is in such a pickle that or so obviously our, the, our you know the music sector that we work in is it will be equally in such a pickle that eventually things will just have to be opened up because I just, you know, at the moment, I, you know, I, I think I might have mentioned it to you, um, you know, the, the, the furlough ends at, at the end of October. Yeah. And at that point, well, it sort of ends twice. It ends at the end of July and then it ends again at the end of October, depending on whether the, country, the, you know, the employer wants to yeah. contribute yeah. any money. So at that point, you know, coming into the, the, the preceding couple of weeks before both those deadline dates, if there's no clear you know, way forward at that point. I, you cannot even begin to imagine the level of unemployment and, and, and redundancies that there'll be in, in this sector. I mean, it's, you know, already we know of companies who've got, let's like, say, maybe 100 employees have got 20, 30, 40 have already had the letter saying they're going to be laid off at the end of July in the music. So I won't say who they are because it might not be public knowledge yet, but that's, yeah. you know, that's going to happen. Um, and I think at the moment, the amount of lobbying that, that, that people have been doing, Stuart Galbraith at Kilimanjaro uh, has been doing a lot of work on it with, with the Concert Promoters Association. They've really pushed on it now. They've really got, finally got somewhere, you know, that, that we're getting a, the message across. Because currently what happens is, is there's all this stuff banging on about theatres and opera and very little about music, right? Which is, I don't know why it happens like that. We're like seeing like the poor relations and, and, and actually, although theatre does actually generate slightly more money for the UK economy than live music, not a huge amount more, but slightly more. We, I think we should be mentioned at least in the same breath. Um, so uh, if you'd have asked me this question three weeks ago, I'd have said there won't be any shows before March of next year. Yeah. But if you're asking me today, I wouldn't be surprised if venues were open this year. <laughs> Because I just cannot see how they, with everything else that's going on, you know, with, with all the breakdown of society and the, you know, and the, the, the lack of social distancing generally and everybody falling out about it. With any sort of social distancing, right, the capacity of a venue is going to be somewhere between 13 and 19%. So, you know, let's say something like the O2, which is getting on for the best part of 20,000. If they got even five or 6,000 in there, it would look pretty sparse. You know, because people have to be seated and spaced out. Now, arguably, you could do it, arguably. But when you look at a venue, say, like the Bullingdon in Oxford, which has got 300 capacity, they've been told their capacity would be 13. <laughs> you know, 
Somewhere like Shepherd's Bush, I'm going to guess the capacity would be something around about 300. You know, it just can't open. They're just not going to bother opening. You know, no one's going to, you know, someone will do it once or twice, you know. And this is the other thing that will be quite weird is even if the venues are allowed to open, and that, but they have got a limited capacity, it means that any show that's already on sale that's sold more tickets than the capacity they've now got will have to be moved anyway. So you might have an absurd sort of situation with, say, one of the bigger venues in London. Let's go Royal Albert Hall. <coughs> say, let's just say it's 3,000 capacity. Sorry, it's three and a half, let's say, for the sake of argument. Let's say they get given a capacity of even 2,000. And they've got 26 shows on sale for November, let's say. It's quite feasible that 22 of those shows will have sold more than 2,000 tickets already. So they're going to have to move anyway. So they, this, is why the, the, yeah. this is the crisis for venues, you see. They don't want to reopen. Well, you can't give people the ticket back, can you? So, yeah. you know, you're going to, have, you're going to end up with four shows in that month if they're lucky, and that's going to be across the board. And so, realistically, uh, you know, I think the argument the venues want to know, well, <laughs> that they're requesting is that when will they be able to open with a full capacity? And probably we need to be given, I don't know, three, four months' notice because it will give them a chance to reload. They might get some shows back in. No one's going to move any shows back that have moved away. But there'll be a, a fair few bands will probably do stuff at short notice. I mean, there'll be a mad scramble. You know, if they suddenly went, oh, yeah, you can open from November the 10th, every single venue will be scrambling around trying to find anybody that will play in their venue, you know. So there'll be a lot of work going for bands. Yeah. Um, so on, outside of the venue, so out to the, the things that are going on at the moment with the drive-ins, and um, there's a few uh, proper shows on now, isn't there? It started with... Um, cinemas and uh, there's some comedy acts doing it uh, there's some theater ones as well isn't there um but now there's been some uh, named artists announced as well i mean how, how do you feel about the the drive-in scenario and standing next to your car or in your car or and how that works for both promoter and audience well i mean you know, i think it sounds horrible <laughs> i mean, I mean I've, some of some bands are going to earn some money some crew are going to be working, some PA and lighting people are going to be working, some stewards are going to get some work. So in a way, I think it's doing the, the, the music industry a service. I, I can't, I, for the life of me, you know, can't imagine going to a drive-in gig. I can imagine going to a drive-in cinema in 1955 in a soft, soft Chevy and yeah. putting the roof down and having some popcorn and somebody come along in rollerblades and stuff like that serving Coca-Cola. But I just, I mean, to me, it's it's pointless. It's completely pointless. And I just think it, but, but you know, I, I don't know if it's selling. I mean, there's some quite big names playing it. I mean, good luck to them. I mean, I'm not, you know, in any way dismissive of, it, of the efforts they've made. I think it's an interesting thing to do. But I do find it a, a somewhat alien concept. And I do think that in a few years' time, people will look back on it. And, and well, hopefully, unless we're still doing it in three, three years' time, they'll look back and go, you know, what were you thinking? Do you know the thing about Britain, Britain, and you know this, it's a Northern Hemisphere country where it rains a lot, right? What if it rains? What if it rains for like four yeah. days in a row and these things are happening and you've got to have your wipers on? You know, and are people going to just stand by their cars under an umbrella? Maybe they are, <coughs> but I don't know. I think it will be quite, I'm, I'm going to, look, but to be fair, I'm going to go to one. I'm going to the very, the first one up at Cuffley, which is the nearest one to London. I think it's Tony Hadley. We're going to do some pay-per-view um, broadcasts. We found this uh, guy. It's a long story. But effectively, we're going to film some shows. And yep. we're going to put them out, pay-per-view. And we're going to see how it goes. I mean, we don't know if it's going to sell. You know, Laura Marlin did the Union Chapel. Yep. Uh, that's the first one of, of that, this sort of thing that went out. I think it did about 6,000 sales. Um, right. So that's pretty good. Yeah. Pretty good. You know, they'll have made, they'll have made money. She'll have made money. We've got a slightly different business model to, to that one, but um, we haven't got one filmed yet. Uh, we've got a, a pilot going out in a, a, well, we're filming it very shortly, uh, but we've got quite a lot of acts interested. So we'll see how that unfolds. I, I think people are jockeying for position a bit in the sense of, they don't really want to do it, but I think eventually they will, because for a lot of groups, what we're offering will be their only income stream for this year. Yeah. And where are you doing um, that in venues, or in, have you got a facility? No, we're doing it, bar, we're doing it in, a, in, a, in a barn, um, a nice barn, I should add, not just a barn. Um, 
it's a it's a guy that's already he's it's already set up. We haven't actually had to build the the whole enterprise. Yeah. It's already set up to do this, and it has been doing some broadcasting, um, but not kind of a sort of music that we that we would would be looking to do. You know, some people are thinking that maybe the pay per view thing will will, will last and it will be complementary to future live performances. Um, but yeah, there's been a bit of saturation recently, hasn't there? Really, uh, with with um, acoustic acts anyway, and and people doing solo things at home. Most of the stuff, and, yeah, uh, most of the stuff that's been going out has been people just doing things at home on their phone. You know, and it's not it's not been properly. This is, I guess, if you want to look at it, this our one would look more like they were on an episode of Jules Holland. Yeah, yeah. It's got proper lights and proper PA and proper proper you know proper filming and multiple cameras, etc. You know, I, I mean, this is the thing. Currently, most of the stuff that's gone out has been free, um, which is fine. You know, I mean, and long may it last, you know, but there's an opportunity possibly there to monetize it. Um, and if you're an artist that's got an album coming out on August the 1st, let's say, you can have a, bro a live broadcast going out to the world that yeah. says, I've got an album coming out. So we're going to you know, see how we get on. So. And we've only really just put the word out about it in the last four days. So, you know, it's a little bit early for me to say, yes, it's definitely going to happen. I think it will happen, but, uh, you know, ask me in a month's time. No, good luck with it. It sounds, sounds great. Um, and the, the kind of thing about um, how people have behaved during this, I know that I've picked up the um, phone a few more times than I, whereas I normally would have emailed or... Um, just sent things back and forth quite quickly I've, I've actually picked up the phone and had more conversations with people and maybe built more relations that i wouldn't have otherwise ventured into um how how have people been with you have you have you felt any of that sort of uh, bonding going on and um <laughs> some, made some connections you wouldn't have otherwise made yeah, I think so. I think you're right. I mean, we've had more Zoom conversations, haven't we? I mean, I think people are going to do that a lot more. I think I tell you one thing we're going to be doing: we're not going to be travelling so far for meetings anymore, are we? There's no need for that that nonsense. Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, it's like a Groundhog Day situation sometimes. So, yeah. I guess it's trying to make make sure you've got a conversation going that's going to have something new to talk about. You know, otherwise it just feels like you're checking in to see how miserable people are sometimes. But yeah, no, you're right. I mean. I, what, I tell you what has changed actually in that time is just the very people's kind of attitudes have changed, you know, in the sense of, you know, they were, you know, they were pessimistic and they were optimistic and they're pessimistic and they're optimistic, you know, which seems to almost change within the course of a day. Um, but also it's interesting actually when this first got, got like got serious, right. And everybody realized that, it was going to have a significant effect on the rest of this year, if not next year as well. There was definitely a sort of softening of everybody's approach. You know, we're all in it together. Yeah. Um, and there's a little bit of me beginning to sense that maybe we're not all in it together again. Because certain, I'm, I'm sensing some people are now getting to the point where they're, they're, they know they're in financial trouble and they're going to have to try and dig their way out of that problem. And the way they're going to dig their way out of that problem is just by having more shows next year or putting the ticket price up or, you know, or trying to redress the balance by. You're, um, you're, you're preempting my, uh, my questions there. Cause that, that, that oh. was going to be the thing that about, yeah, those, those relations and how it's been, it's nice that the good things that have come out of it are maybe you know, people connecting a bit more and maybe goodwill in general, goodwill to one another. And the question was, is, is will that continue or, or will that dissipate as people realize they need to scramble their way to the top? I'd like to think it would continue, but, you know, I mean, in, in promoter land, you know, I mean, it, you know, I guess there's always been a struggle between agents and promoters to an extent, you know, not a massive struggle, but, you know, I mean, agents always feel that promoters don't pay enough and promoters always think they're paying the agent too much, you know, so, you know, and I, and I, I was hoping and it might well be possible still, but, I think it'll all depend on what the economy looks like. And, you know, entertainment is, is weird, right? Because it's sort of protected from the, the, from the vagaries of, of Ill, Ill fortune sometimes. Because I think it's one of the last things people kind of cross off the things that they can no longer do. Once you stop going out and you pull the drawbridge up, you know you're in trouble, right? 
have you um, have you been involved or have good knowledge of the the support networks that are out there so music venue trusts and um, the, the Clapham Grand did a, a campaign uh, last week and numerous venues are, are, are trying to save themselves and, and raise money um, uh, yeah have you been involved in any kind of thing like that or only talking to the people that, that you know, I mean, the music venue trust people we speak to, um, look, they're looking to get funding for, for, for the venues, you know, for themselves. Um, I know 50 million has been a figure that's been put out there, but if we, if you divide that by the number of venues that there are, I think it equates to not much more than about 6,250 pounds each. Yeah. So I think that figure it probably have to be quadrupled to have any significant effect on them. Yeah. Um, I think the Lexington, they, they did a crowdfunding, didn't they, I think, as well. Um, I think people have done all sorts of stuff. You know, I, I noticed it in, uh, in Austin, because around the time of South by Southwest not happening, you know, you're getting all the emails from all the venues and tell you what's going on sort of thing. And uh, they were doing, like, you know, subscription-type things, send us 50 bucks and you can come to 10 free shows next year and buy a T-shirt and you get, you know, two, three tickets for two shows of your choice. And I think people, again, have gone down that route. But, you know, unfortunately, um, I think a high percentage of these small venues are in some degree of trouble. Now, people are going to get to the end of this and they're still going to be going. But when they reopen their venues or start trying to promote shows again, that's when they might run out of money. You know, they might be at the end of their tether. They might just get to reopening again, let's say randomly November the 1st. They might get to like November the 30th and all of a sudden the bills start coming in and they haven't got the money to pay it. You know, and it, that, that's the problem they've got. It, it's, you know, it's like, a, it's like a load of these companies. It's whether they're going to bankrupt themselves on July the 31st or bankrupt themselves on October the 31st or whether they're going to just soldier on and try and get through it all. But it, it won't be easy. Um, I suppose what they're really saying to the government is at what point uh, is, is it, do you think it's going to be safe? You know, but I mean, I don't suppose they, they don't seem to know any more than any of us, but you know, I, the public in terms of, 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 of the public will go out when they're ready to go out. Ultimately, I think, you know, and clearly there's some parts of British society already think that time has come, you know, so um We'll see. I mean, you know, I, I can't begin to t tell you how many false dawns there appears to have been, you know, and then we've actually got doomsayers the other way going, you know, it's not going to open until November of next year. Some people say November of next year. Well, let's not, let's not go there. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Paul, for doing this. You're welcome. Um, like I said, I hope um, some good comes out of this and we, and we all get back to it soon enough um stuff that we've talked about i'll put all the links on the, on the page and stuff so people can drill down and find more information of, about what you guys are doing and uh and the support that's out there and stuff like that um so i'll, I'll hopefully see you in a venue soon um and thank yes, you very much good. cheerio <laughs>